Now recall in section 9.1, we had critical Z values for our confidence intervals. Let me pull up the exam note sheet that you get to use on your exam packets from the appendix, which by the way, at this point, you should have that whole packet out and stapled and on you at all times. You should have had it out since chapter seven because we use it from chapter seven onward. Anyway, when you look at this right here, you can see that a single sample proportion, one prop Z int, uses Z alpha over two, see it right there? And that's because this capital or square root, excuse me, of P hat times one minus P hat over N is a basic approximation of sigma from a binomial distribution. If you recall, we've seen that formula before, more or less, and it was from section 8.2, it was the approximation for the standard error of the sampling distribution of, standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample proportions. In other words, sigma. So we were able to kind of finagle a sigma out of knowing p hat, but we no longer can do that in section 9.2, and that's because we don't have the binomial distribution backing us up. We're now stuck with t curves, t intervals, not knowing the mean. So when you don't know the mean, you don't know sigma because sigma is built from the mean. So you can't really use a z curve if you don't know what the mean is, and the standard deviation is for that matter. Okay, so if that's the case, we're going to be stuck using this kind of worse curve called the T curve. That's why it's called a T interval, and that's why in here you see T alpha over 2. All right, so we need to take a moment and work on the T curve. So what I just said is what was written up here. You can't use the Z curve. You don't know sigma, so you're stuck using student's T distribution. Student, by the way, was the... Um, the code name for the person that published this work. He was working for Guinness Brewing Company, um, the same Guinness Brewing Company that's in Ireland that makes stout. That's where he was working actually in Ireland. And he figured this out, but he didn't want to publish it under his real name because he didn't want to get fired um, because it was considered um, trade secrets by the Guinness Brewing Company. So he published under the name student to hide who he was. Anyway, we'll call it the T curve, the T distribution, etc., as opposed to the Z curve, which is that standard normal curve. Right now, how do they compare? Well, I have them drawn for you right here. The Z curve is the black one and the T curve is the gray one. And you can see that the black curve is taller, right? It has a taller peak and it has, um, it's a little bit narrower and smaller tails. And that's because it has smaller spread than the T curve. There, and I've labeled them for you so you can see. So the black curve is that taller one. That's the Z curve, the best curve, the curve we would love to use if we could, but we can't. And then there's the T curve. Now, the thing about the T curve is it depends on how many, um, well, it depends on degrees of freedom, which for our purposes is going to be dependent upon how big your sample is. And we'll talk more about that below in this box, but there is only one Z curve, the Z curve, right? The standard normal curve. It's got a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. It's the best, right? T curves are similar to that, right? They have a lot of the similar properties. That gray curve is very close, but it's not the same. And that's, that difference can make, quote, all the difference, end quote, um, when you're doing problems. Because if you try to use the Z curve when you shouldn't, you'll end up with wrong answers. All right, so different T distributions are um, for different degrees of freedom. So your degrees of freedom for now is N minus one, right? So it's the um, sample size, which is N, take away one. Okay? And that's because the first N minus one things are free to be whatever they want, but the last one has to be whatever it takes to make that curve. And that's all I'm going to say about that for this for our purposes for right now. Um, it's symmetric around mu equals zero, just like the Z curve. That's why they both have the same center at zero. So that's still the same for both of them. And just like any probability distribution, because the T curve is a probability density curve, right? And that means that the area under the whole thing is one because it's still a probability. And that also means the area to the left of the middle and the right of the middle is still 0.5, just like it is with the Z curve because half the curve is on the left, half the curve is on the right, and it's still a continuous probability function, density function. All right, now the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote, just like it is for the black curve. It's just that it takes a little while longer to get there. That's why the, the tails are a little fatter up here. So it's still the asymptote, but it takes a little bit longer to kind of get down towards that x-axis, whereas the black curve has got a smaller spread, so it gets to the um, x-axis much faster. Of course, they both never touch the x-axis. That's what an asymptote is, but they're skimming along it. 
all right? It's going to be more spread out, as you guys can see, from your Z distribution. So it's going to have fatter tails, right? Slightly taller, fatter tails, and a shorter peak in the middle, right? That's greater spread. In other words, its standard deviation is not one. It's something else. And then as the sample size increases, the density curve gets closer to the Z distribution. Well, that's interesting. So remember that there's lots and lots and lots of different curves. It's technically infinitely many of them, right? So if that's the case, what I'm saying down here is that if you let your sample size get bigger, then the curve gets closer to that black curve, that Z curve that you really, really want. And I'm going to illustrate that bottom one, that number seven, in an example right here. So I have two curves drawn below. One has degrees of freedom four and one degrees of freedom one. And you're supposed to label each one, but as you can see, I've labeled them. So I, I made this video before and I got eaten by my computer. I apologize. So the degrees of freedom of one means that your sample size must have been two. And that's because, right, sample size of two, two take away one gets you one, right? In other words, you add one to your degrees of freedom. And up here, we have a degrees of freedom of four, and that means that our sample size must have been five, but that's a better curve, right? It's taller in the center, smaller in the tails. It's still not the Z curve, right? The Z curve, if you look at 2.5, see how fat that is at 2.5? See how high up above the axis the black curve is? So if I go back here to my normal curve, look at 2.5 here. Do you see how narrow that is? Do you see how small that is? Right? That's because the Z curve is even got even smaller tails than what we're seeing here. These are both actually nowhere close to the Z curve, statistically speaking. Right? So degrees of freedom one, degrees of freedom four. But you can see that the black curve here is closer to the Z curve than the gray curve is. And that's what they're getting at with that bottom part. Right? The larger your sample, then the larger your degrees of freedom. And the larger your degrees of freedom, the closer you are to the normal curve. There, and I just typed that up real quickly. So just to show you where the degrees of freedom came from, right? It came from adding one, there's me, where the n came from. It came from adding one to our degrees of freedom. Just a little logic there. And that means the larger your degrees of freedom, the larger your n, they go hand in hand, and that would make your curve, the t curve, closer to a z curve. All right, we're going to stop right there because now we're going to have to be able to find those T-curve values. And that we will do in the next video.